News drives markets. And every day, Montel's experienced reporters are on top of the stories that shape European market developments. Can you afford to miss out? Go to montelnews.com for the latest price driving stories and a free trial. Hello listeners and welcome to the Montel Weekly Podcast, bringing energy matters in an informal setting. In today's pod, listeners, we have the good fortune of being joined by several illustrious meteorologists, all experts in their field. With 2020 the warmest year on record and freak weather incidents, such as the recent extreme cold weather in Texas, we will discuss the impact of these changes on Europe's energy system. Can we expect the beast from the east to make a regular appearance? And what would be the impact of a Texas-like snowmageddon on the continent and in Northern Europe? Also, what's the outlook for the coming weeks and the season ahead? So, I'm Richard Sverison, and help me to discuss these issues is Mark Stevens-Rowe of IBM Weather. A warm welcome back, Mark. I hope you're well. I'm very well, thank you. And uh, yes, thanks for inviting me. Looking forward to it. In addition, we have Julian Telford of MetDesk. Hello, Julian. Uh, a pleasure to have you on board. Yeah, hi, Richard. Finally, last but not least, we have Frederick Cronwell of SMHI. Welcome to you, Frederick. Thank you very much. Let's get started and look at um, at the short-term weather outlook. And, and for those who might be able to travel, where will the good weather be uh, over Easter, Mark? The good weather. For those going skiing, it might be uh, snowy conditions. And for those uh, in more sunnier climbs, it would be hot and dry. Yeah, it's interesting, actually, because right now the, the cold weather is is actually sort of more persisting around the Alps. So what snow there is there is actually sort of kind of staying pretty much. Temperatures are anywhere between sort of three and five degrees below normal in, in quite a lot of the Alpine countries and really focused on the Alps. That that does look like that's going to shift, though, a little bit. So um, I think we are expecting things to start warming up as we head towards the sort of kind of the, the, the proper Easter period. But I think in the main, they've actually had some fairly good snow conditions. And certainly there's there's not much sign of that rapidly melting, at least in the in the immediate future. Yeah, I'd certainly miss it. Uh, I think the last time I went skiing actually was was an Easter ski in the Alps, but about three years or so ago. And this, we were definitely planning on thinking about doing it this year, but yeah, not happening, unfortunately. <laughs> no, not not this year. How about you, Frederick? What, what's your short term uh, view? Yes, we have in for a cold spell actually in the next coming days. Uh, we have a high high pressure west of Britain, giving northeasterly winds, so bringing down the cold air of the continental Europe. So maybe down to seven, eight, nine degrees below reference as a minimum towards the weekend of France and Germany. You said uh, we're up in for a milder period from late weekend, and that's a shift in the weather regime since now lows will come from the Atlantic on the west on quite northerly tracks and uh, pushing this high down over the continent instead of west of the continent. So we get a westerly airflow so starting mild in the north, but also climbing up what's reference temperatures over the con- continent next week. Well, what do you think here, Julian? Yeah, pretty much what the uh, other guys have been saying there. But yeah, this cold air is uh, flooding across mainland Europe at the moment. So temperatures are about 1500 metres up across the Alps. They're going to be around about minus seven degrees or so at this uh, coming weekend. So the freezing level is very close to the surface. So there has been bits and pieces of more snow across the Alps through this week, drier over the weekend, but still uh, still uh, very cold. But the actual snow depth anomalies at the moment across Switzerland are generally around about 120 to 140 percent of normal for this time of year. So that's at uh, 2000 meters height. So we've got about two meters plus worth of snow depth still going on across the Alps at that level at the moment. So very good skiing conditions if we could get out skiing. And this cold setup has been very much well forecast over these last couple of weeks just gone. We could see this cold coming into place. Different reasons for that, maybe we'll talk about that later on perhaps, but looking at different teleconnections, you could see this pattern beginning to set up. But we also think that will start moving away, as the other guys have said there, as Frederick and uh, Mark have said. So going through next week, we'll see pressure beginning to build across mainland Europe. Low pressure come in 
towards the UK. So that just allows a bit more of a southwesterly flow to develop. And so those temperatures will be coming up across those alpine regions next week. So by the end of next week, I think the uh, freezing level will be somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 meters. So that's a big rise in that freezing level. Not particularly mild for the time of year, but given a bit of sunshine coming through, we'll start to see melt again at those uh, lower lower areas, at those uh, lower slopes. But still good skiing, I think, in your mid to upper slopes, I think, as we go into the Easter period. And at that stage, as we go into Easter, I think your highest pressure, the most settled conditions are probably going to be across East and Northeast Europe and actually into Scandinavia. It looks as though it could be fairly dry there with more unsettled conditions approaching the UK, I, I suggest, at this stage. Well, all three of you have mentioned the snow conditions. What are the implications here for when, when the weather does turn mild, certainly at these higher altitudes, and, and for, for snow melt and for the spring, uh, spring melting season? Yeah, as Julian said, I mean, there's, there's a fair bit there to, to come out of the Alps. So I, I would expect the various rivers draining away from the Alps, Rhine, Danube, etc., cetera, to, uh, to start seeing some of that, that entering, you know, probably as we, as we kind of go a little bit further into, into the first week of April or so. We are seeing that the, the NAO, the North Atlantic Oscillation Index, which is currently negative, is, is likely to swing into a, a more positive direction. And therefore, you know, one would expect to see warmer conditions, as Julian was saying. And, you know, combined with, with rain now starting to fall at the lower levels as well, we'll, we'll almost certainly start to see the, um, it, it start pouring off. I know, I think the Easter, oh gosh, was it three years or so ago? Maybe four years now that I actually went. The day we arrived in the Alps, even at about it was just under 1,800 meters, the temperature was 21 degrees. <laughs> it was um, it was really quite phenomenal, and um, but but yet there was still a fair amount of snow on the mountains, but below that level, it was it was really flying off the slopes pretty rapidly, and and certainly by the end of that week, there was a fair bit of bare rock starting to appear. I think at this stage, it doesn't look like there's going to be that much, I, you know, I wouldn't have said there was going to be a massive surge of, of water out of the mountains, but um, it might be worthwhile, you know, Scandinavia, I know certainly some of the longer range outlooks are, are showing a lot of pink colours appearing now in, in that department over the next few weeks. So you may well start to see some fairly rapid melting in the, in the Nordic region, in the, in the mountains there. So that, that could be a place to watch. Mm. I was going to ask Frederick about this. I mean, I'm, you're you're maybe a little bit far from the slopes in in Gothenburg, Frederick. But what what's it looking like in in, in the Nordic region in terms of uh, snow reserves and and the outlook for the snow melt once milder weather comes in in maybe in in, in mid to late April? It's quite opposite from the previous year because then we have a, had a lot of snow in the western mountains where it normally should be since we had a mild winter and westerly winds. This winter we have quite the opposite. You have a, quite a lot of snow east of the mountain but not that much in the most western parts. So it's actually not where it should be. So it's, it's not that extreme amounts of snow in the Nordics. But as you mentioned, uh, Mark, um, I think we're in for some melting ahead. And, and the monthly forecast we got this Tuesday actually was quite mild, very much milder than the previous one. For example, um, the first week of April, it, it's in general uh, one to three degrees above reference in the northern continent, in the Scandinavian areas, quite mild, especially in the north. I, I think the uncertainty is how mild it will be on the continent <laughs> near the center of the high. So, so the position of the high is very sensitive, but I think it's more certain that we will get the mild westerlies uh, over the Nordics, but for the continent, some some more uncertainty, but but getting milder there too, but, but how fast is a little uncertain. What does it mean for the hydrological balance in the Nordic region? I mean, what's your expectations here in the coming weeks? We, we know that uh, the reservoirs are, are, are very full or have been very full. What's your outlook here, Frederick? Since we have, as you said, filled reservoirs and, and uh, at least normal amounts of snow, even if it's not in the western part where it normally is. So it's a good situation for the, for the Nordic situation, I think. I think starting at least in the southern mountain areas, you could get some melt already here in late, uh, early April. Let's turn to the, the sort of more longer-term seasonal outlooks. If I can start with you, Julian, what's your view here for the second quarter out towards June? I'll move on to that. It's, it's very, very interesting, the comments which uh, Frederick just made there. Sorry to just step 
back slightly, Richard, sure, because of sure, that no hydro worries. situation across the uh, Nordics, where he talked about a bit less snow build up on the uh, west side of Norway there and more further east. And then last year was that completely different situation. And of course, you could predict this quite early on, as soon as we saw the SSW, that sudden stratospheric warming event occurring on January the 4th this year. So that broke up the vortex in, in, the, in the stratosphere, and that can lead to more negative AO, negative NAO situations. And that means less westerly flow into these northern latitudes. Completely different to last year. So last year we had that very strong polar vortex. So those westerly winds were crashing in. And it was very mild across Europe, wasn't it, last winter? But if you had your little webcam onto Fintz on the kind of west side of Norway there, where I tend to do when I'm lacking snow in the UK and I just dream of snow, you could see it really piling up at Fintz railway station there. It was going up and up and up and up. So the west side of Norway did super well last winter for the amount of snow. And of course, that can then melt through the spring season and, and feed your reservoirs and rivers. Whereas this year, as Frederick said, because we've had the negative AO, negative NAO situation, that the, the snow anomalies are in a different position and further to the east. So I just thought it's worth to just have a look that you can kind of predict these things as the season evolves. You know, you might not go for this SSW at the start of the winter season, but as soon as you can see that happening, you can then see implications further down the line, which then lead into the, into the spring, you know, on, on the hydro situation. But looking forward, Richard, because I know you asked me the question, you want to move this uh, topic onwards. A big thing which we look at at MetDesk, and there's a lot of discussion within, within the Met world, and, and that is you know, the, the sea ice situation, or the Arctic sea ice situation. And we think it even has implications into the spring and into the summer. Now, this is the reduced coverage of, of Arctic sea ice because of global warming. And mm. uh, we see the uh, particularly low amounts of sea ice develop around the uh, Barents Kara Sea. That area is where we see some of the lowest anomalies. And coming into the end of the winter now and into the start of spring, then we do see, if you were to refer to the National Snow and Ice Data Center, the NSIDC, you would see again we've got low levels of, of sea ice coverage. And if you then use that, because if you think Globally, you know, what's the big things which can be teleconnection drivers around the uh, globe with different weather systems? How can it change the kind of long range weather waves and patterns? Then, you know, the Arctic is a big place and we've got big changes going on there. So we need to kind of refer to that. We can think of Enzo and El Nino and La Nina and stuff, but it's just as big to be thinking about the Arctic sea ice. And what we found in the uh, what we call like the really low sea ice era and we kind of take a, a bit of a random point 2007 year 2007 onwards what we found for april so just leading forward to look through april we, we've seen that on many many occasions that high pressure tends to build more across mainland Europe, particularly, well, large parts of mainland Europe, including across uh, Germany and into the, into the UK and France as well. And we've seen many, many fine Aprils, low, low winds, high solar, temperatures above normal. Whereas if you go to the kind of era before that and looks at, say, 1993 to 2006, so a, a, another 14 year period, you've got a completely different set up across uh, Europe with low pressure widely across Europe and much more unsettled conditions. And we think that, um, I mean, there's going to be ongoing research and looking at this and PhDs and, and, and so on. But we think that Arctic sea ice is having these effects right through the year with different lags and so on. But we think that there is a, a good possibility of high pressure dominating European conditions through the month of, of April. So we are expecting like precipitation to be low normal, solar to be on the high side, wind to be on the low side, and temperatures actually to average above normal. Of course, there'll be day-to-day -day variations and, and even week-to-week -week variations. But as an average for the month, we think is a high possibility of a pressure above normal across Europe. 
And we are beginning to see that in some of the medium range weather models, the middle of this week. So looking at the latest kind of models on, on Wednesday, the pressure is generally beginning to build as we approach April. And also some of the uh, longer term models like the EC46 has hinted at uh, pressure beginning to rise across uh, Europe as well. So that's, that's our position for April. Um, I'll let the other guys speak, otherwise I'm going to talk forever. <laughs> but going into the summer, you end up with a little bit of a different setup based on this low sea ice, where actually northwest Europe can end up being a little bit more unsettled, again, using sea ice as, as a teleconnection driver. So something for people to consider. Um, this is fascinating. So the, the, the reduced sea ice is then having that knock-on effect to boosting uh, temperatures and, and uh, in, in more continental Europe. I think that's a very interesting development which you've highlighted very well there, Julian. But how about you, Mark? I mean, what are you, is, are you seeing similar story for April? And maybe you could talk a little bit about beyond April from, from what IBM weather, how you see it? You know, totally agree with Julian. I mean, I've, I've always been a long, you know, long recognised that the, 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 the sort of the dramatic change in, in Arctic sea ice since about 2007 has clearly, I think, played a, a huge impact on, on changing patterns of weather over 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 northwest Europe. Unsurprisingly, we're when you know we're not that far away, if you like, from the Arctic Ocean. I think some of our scientists, we we uh, I think you've met Dr. Todd Crawford, who produces uh, many of our long-range seasonal forecasts, and I think he he often reflects that there are different seasons that are more greatly affected by the changes in the Arctic sea ice pattern, as as Julian was alluding to there. But he's certainly right. I think a April, you know, we ha we have seen this quite with quite systematic change. I mean, a a April showers, you know, uh, there are many sayings in many northwestern <laughs> European countries of a very similar nature around April. And we, you know, when I was growing up and keeping weather records, then yes, I, I remember that you know the April hailstorms and even snow and so on, and that that has become definitely much much less frequent. You know, in the last decade or so, we've we've seen this this run of of rather warmer and better Aprils. But as you go into the summer, then you know that that pattern definitely does change, and you know because the Arctic is is one of the places in the world that's warmed up that much more rapidly than anywhere else, you've kind of sort of changed the dynamic in the atmosphere where the colder north and the warmer south, which is you know the climatologically normal pattern, the strength, if you like, of that difference in temperature has weakened. People remember last year, I think that the temperature you know above thirty eight degrees well north of, of Arctic Circle in, in parts of Siberia and Russia. So you're seeing effectively the sort of the dynamic that, that really drives Northern Hemispheric weather weakening. And that, that has, unfortunately for us in Northwest Europe, particularly UK, in some recent summers meant that, you know, we, we've ended up having, relatively speaking, you know, fairly, fairly grim weather. Last summer, I think, was, it was a bit of an exception to that. I think July ended up being... Um, not particularly brilliant, whereas June and August, either side of that, were still actually pretty warm. But, you know, when I look at our own maps, there's just no blue. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's very few places that end up seeing temperatures sort of typically that much below normal, if you like. And, you know, if you look at international respected forecasting organizations like the European Centre, we what we actually do at, at the weather company is to sort of kind of analyze their forecasts and then actually try to take out some of the biases that sit in some of these long range forecasts to give you a, a better idea, if you like, of, of, the, of the true pattern. So they, uh, these days, the, the long term models very rarely seem to have that much blue in them. But when you do put this calibration on top of it, you can start to see, you know, patterns shift a little bit. But certainly if we're looking into the summer months, you know, sort of kind of June, July, August, then Again, you know, the, the chances of more normal, if you like, temperatures are higher if you're looking at somewhere like the UK, perhaps northwest France, parts of Scandinavia, whereas the, the, the countries that are most likely to see even above normal temperatures are, are tending to be further south and east into Europe. But generally speaking, it, it's, it's going to be above normal, whatever that is these days, <laughs> virtually everywhere, I think. But yeah, uh, if, if we're allowed a summer holiday, I think the place that seems to be showing up, you know, on, on our maps as one of the highest risk of well above normal temperatures is actually Turkey. <laughs> so, okay, okay. Um, you know, and they're doing pretty well with the vaccinations, I gather, as well. So, I mean, 
Good, good tip there, Mark. How do you view this, Frederick? I mean, do you agree with your your colleagues here that uh, it's going to be above normal uh, for the for the coming three months? Uh, and where are the risks in, in these forecasts? Yes, in general, that, that's the best guess for me too. <laughs> uh, actually, looking at the latest EC seasonal forecast, it has the same development as we see now with more westerly conditions over the Nordics and the more high pressure over the central southern parts of Europe. Uh, so you get temperatures above reference and you get quite wet in western Norway, Norway but dry on the continent. And as you mentioned, uh, Mark, uh, heat wave in, in Turkey, but possibly also Spain <laughs> in June, according to the latest DC forecast. But I would also like to mention that uncertainty is quite large in this scale compared to the monthly forecast, for example. As you mentioned, uh, Julian, about the sudden stratospheric warming, that's a very strong connector for the monthly time scale. And we had decreasing polar vortex in January, if giving us some cold weeks in February, especially. And so that's a quite strong connection. And we also have some uh, other circulations, um, Madden Julian oscillation, that's a tropical waves around the equator, also feeding back towards. NO index for Northern Europe. But on the seasonal scale, it's you don't have that strong connections. El Nino is the, the main feeding component for the, the seasonal forecast. And unfortunately, Europe is the farthest away from that region. So the connection is weak. And you have, as we also mentioned, the sea ice conditions and in the polar Arctic. And that's maybe the most important thing. Uh, and, and I agree about melting ices and, and that will feed back towards mild conditions for Europe. But some interesting uh, thing is, uh, for example, 2018, we had quite a cold February, March, uh, with a lot of sea ice in the Nordics and a lot of snow late in the season. So we expected that to feed back towards the coldest spring since the ice and the snow should melt. But then we got the mildest, the warmest May mm-hmm. ever, 2018. Mm-hmm. And also the whole summer was extremely warm. So, so that just explains that I think the uncertainty is very much higher on the seasonal scale than in the monthly forecast, for example. Mm, absolutely. that The uncertainty there is, is very clear with, a, with a, anything beyond... Beyond 10 days, really, the uncertainty rises. But um, if I can stick with you, Frederick, we talked a little bit about an introduction about extreme weather conditions. You know, in February, we saw extreme weather, very, very cold conditions, which affected the energy system in Texas to a very large extent. Not just the energy system, but the whole state. I mean, it was a, there was a quite dramatic pictures. So I want to, to, to start off by asking you, Frederick, you know, how likely is a similar extreme weather situation in Europe? We've been talking about, you know, the, the warming climate, but here in terms of colder weather. And what would the effect be, say, if, if it struck in northwest Europe? I think uh, um, the probability is less for Europe because North America is North America. <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot of extremes coming together there. You have the Mexican Gulf with extreme mild conditions, and you have Alaska with Arctic conditions, and you have mountains from the west to east blocking. You have north southerly mountains, so, so the, the cold can reach very far south there, and, and the mild can also come up very far north. You don't have that extreme over Europe because you have the Alps and the Pyrenees blocking the most extreme events for Europe. So, I mean, 20 degrees below re- reference is, not, is very unlikely of the European continent, I think. But, of course, you can have cold spells, but I think even more realistic is, is extreme heat waves in the summertime, as we've seen some years already, where you can have up to 40, 45 degrees up over Central Europe. So I think that's a, a more high probability for that extreme events for Europe than, than you get 20 below reference in wintertime. Absolutely. W- would you agree here, Julian? Yeah, just looking back um, at, at Texas, the peak or the, the absolute trough part of, of the cold, so where it was at its most cold was February the 16th, where we had a temperature of minus eight as a whole averaged out across Texas as a 24-hour 
average. So minus eight, that's 22 degrees below normal for that time of year. So that is really extreme. So if we put that across to Germany and took that same anomaly, we'd need Germany to have an average temperature of minus 20, and we'd need France to have an average temperature of minus 16. Now we saw that uh, this, the first half of February this year, based on that SSW and the negative NAO, we had some pretty cold conditions. But just remember to be the same equivalent to Texas, we need minus 20 for Germany. On this occasion, we had minus seven on the 10th of February. So it was still 13 degrees short of that anomaly. So it was nowhere near as extreme in a pretty cold situation. So it really would be hard work to get those temperatures as low as that. Now, to be honest, I haven't seen, I don't know the record low or recent record lows for Germany, but my mind takes me back to different occasions. You've got the February into March 2013. That was again another SSW. That was very, uh, very cold there. February, March 2018. We talked about that briefly. Again, that was an SSW. But if we go back to February 2012, now, this brings me back to my skiing memories, uh, Mark, here, because uh, I think it was uh, something like the 8th of February, or was it the 12th of February? I can't remember the exact date that I disappeared down to the Alps and went skiing. And it was super cold. It was really, really cold. I think minus 20 or lower in flame on the French ski resort there when I when I arrived. It got slightly less cold during the week I was there, but that first half of February was super cold. Can't tell you exactly where those temperatures were, but you guys might know better than me, but I think there was a, a really big spike in, in energy price during that time somewhere in February 2012 because it got so cold and we ran out of wind as well. So we had like that double whammy of reduced supply and a really big demand going on. And uh, yeah, that caused problems. Do I think we're going to see similar problems? We might. We might. I mean, when SSWs happen, we can still get severe cold. If we get the winds from the northeast out of Russia, then we can get severe cold. But to get that low, I think is highly unlikely. And uh, I actually agree with, with uh, Frederick, even though we see in summer months, based on the low sea ice, as we've seen before, actually northwest Europe getting a little bit more unsettled. There are occasions of extreme heat. Go back to summer 19, summer 2019. Then was it 47 degrees we saw in France? Something ridiculously high. So we'll still get these. I think the higher extremes are more likely than the lower extremes. And yeah, that can cause problems in, in different ways because uh, of cooling demand and, and then problems with nukes and, and river levels and things like that. So I'm um, with uh, Frederick on, on this. France is particularly sensitive to these weather events. But, you know, we saw in February 2012, we saw prices in France go up to almost 400 euros a megawatt hour. So if I can sort of round off with you here, Mark, are the summer sort of drought, heat waves, low river levels, warmer temperatures, which cause cooling problems at, at nuclear and also thermal plants, are they more likely than the kind of extreme freezing conditions that we that we saw in texas yeah i, I certainly agree with both my colleagues that the um you know extreme heat events definitely you know are becoming that much more frequent than extreme cold events having said all that of course i mean we, we not talked about or even mentioned uh, poor old spain back in january I mean, minus yeah, 34 yeah. Yeah. I, un unbelievable really and certainly some of my my ibm colleagues in in madrid you know we were corresponding with them at the time meters of snow building up outside their windows in 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 the middle of Madrid. So, you know, the reality is, is that even in this warmed world, we are still going to see some cold extremes, but it's, it's much more likely that the heat extremes are, you know, are going to be that much more frequent, fortunately or unfortunately, and certainly in places like Spain and France and probably, you know, Greece and as well. Well, you know, I, I think it's, it's almost inevitable that we, we, we're going to hit 50 degrees Celsius somewhere, you know, in the next sort of 20 or so years. I think the, um, you know, the, some of those places down there will, will probably get, get that uh, unfortunate record broken. But yeah, we'll still see some cold weather. I mean, it's worth bearing in mind, even in the UK, in that cold spell we just had in February, temperatures in, in central Scotland actually fell to the lowest level in February since 1956. You know, so we, we were still breaking some very long term records, albeit briefly. But I think, yeah, yet again, probably during this summer, 
there will be at least one fairly substantial heat wave, I suspect, when you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be talking about records being broken again. But it's, it's probably more likely in southern parts of Europe this summer than it perhaps was in, in northern and, and central parts of Europe in, in a couple of the more recent summers. But um, yeah, with, with, us, with us all being potentially still uh, confined <laughs> to our, our own countries, I'm sure, whether it's UK or, or Scandinavia, a, a few days in the high 20s and low 30s would be much appreciated. <laughs> Absolutely. I can concur there. But a final thing that I've, I've been sort of alerted to in the, in the past few weeks is that during the pandemic, you know, commercial flights have been drastically reduced. They make a contribution to to weather forecasting, don't they, uh, Frederick? Does this create some problems from you in, 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 in the short term forecasting? Yes, of course. Uh, I mean, um, observations, uh, you mean, from the aircraft are uh, crucial for the weather forecast models. There's some effect about that. Then we have, of course, the satellites <laughs> giving a lot of data, but uh, that affects, of course, where the forecast holds. Does it make them less accurate, would you say? Yes, I don't have any numbers of that, but that affects at least. Perfect, guys. Thanks ever so much. We could talk um, probably for, for hours and hours, so, but hopefully we can... Uh we can return to these topics at, or, or similar topics at, at a later date. And I, I'd like to thank you very much for, you know, uh, always it's a pleasure to talk about the SSW, the Polar Vortex and the NA, NAOs. You're extending my, my vocabulary quite considerably. So thank you very much, Frederick. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. No problem. Good to talk to you, Richard. And thank you, Julian. You're welcome. So listeners, you can now follow the podcast on our own Twitter account, aptly named the Monto Weekly Podcast. Please direct message any suggestions questions or you know let us know if you if you think you have a good idea for a guest on the show you can also send us an email to podcast at montelnews.com lastly remember to keep up to date with all that's happening in energy markets on montel news you can subscribe on apple podcasts and spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from thank you and goodbye